Welcome to A Scientist Walks Into a Bar. I'm Amanda Thomas, and today I have a fun interview about death. I got to talk with Caitlin Doty, who is a mortician, activist, and funeral industry rabble rouser. You may know her from her Ask a Mortician video series on YouTube, where she talks about whether or not you can freeze dry your corpse, or if you can keep your parents' skull. She's also the author of three books so far. The first is Smoke Gets in Your Eyes and Other Lessons from the Crematory. The second is From Here to Eternity, Traveling the World to Find the Good Death. The book we're talking about today is Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs? Big Questions from Tiny Mortals About Death, which as of now in September 2020 is out in paperback. In it, she answers questions about death that were submitted by kids, like what happens if an astronaut dies in space or whether or not you can give your grandma a Viking funeral. I asked her why she thinks it's important to talk to kids about death. We discussed how she feels about Halloween decorations. We also touched on some green burial methods, and she told me one of the worst things about her work. Spoiler, it doesn't have anything to do with bodies. Instead, it's internet trolls. I'll put all kinds of links in the episode notes on how to find out more about her and how to get the book. Also, since we're all working from home and I was inside a room with a closed door, one of my cats decided that she simply must be allowed to participate. You may hear some meows and scratching in the background. With that, here's my conversation with Caitlin. Welcome to the podcast, Caitlin Doty. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to have you here today. I was hoping that we could get you here at an event in Portland at some point, but the world had other plans for us. So, but I'm I'm glad to have you here and to talk about your book, Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs? Big Questions from Tiny Mortals About Death. And can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Oh, gosh, where do I begin? Actually, I was born in Hawaii, born and raised in Hawaii. I went to the University of Chicago and studied medieval history, where I realized I was very interested in medieval death culture and rituals. So when I moved to San Francisco after I graduated and could not find a job in medieval history, funny story, I took a job at a crematory. And that was about 13 years ago. And I've been in the funeral industry ever since. My main thing is that I try to open a dialogue around death. Um, I started a movement called Death Positivity, which doesn't mean that you're happy that grandma died. It means that you realize that it's very important, like you know, body positivity or sex positivity. It's very important to have open, honest, realistic conversations about death and dying, especially since in the United States, we don't have a great relationship with death and a great relationship with talking about death. And so I talk about what goes on behind the scenes in the funeral industry. I now uh, own my own funeral home here in Los Angeles. And I have a web series called Ask a Mortician that talks about basically I'm just a one-stop death awareness shop is how I would describe myself. (laughs) And you have written two other books before this one, correct? Correct. Yes. The first book that I wrote was called Smoke Gets in Your Eyes, and it's a memoir about my first year in the funeral industry working at that crematory and the bodies and the living people and the history and all sorts of things that I learned entering the funeral industry. And then the second book is called From Here to Eternity, and it's about traveling around the world to look at different death customs and see how they can help us understand our own deaths in the United States and the Western world. Sounds fascinating. And can you tell us about this book, the Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs book? This book started because when I was touring, and I've been touring for years to do talks and events, and one of my favorite things to do is a Q&A. And my favorite questions in the Q&A tend to be when someone brings their young child to the event because they'll just stand up and they'll ask something. And that's where the title comes from and kind of where the genesis of the book came from was a young boy who stood up and, and asked, you know, when I die, will my cat eat my eyeballs? 
And it was such a good question. And it was so hyper specific that I just <laughs> fell in love with it. And I fell in love with the idea of compiling these questions from children about death and specifically the dead body because, you know, they're no bullshit. They get, they get right to the point. If you have a kid, you know this. They are unfiltered. They don't have the weird societal solemnity, let's be respectful, it's bad to talk about it, veneer around them when they ask questions about death. And that's what I want adults to have as well, is just, to, you know, take no prisoners, ask all the questions, view about death. The first question that I had prepared for myself was, who were the kids who asked the questions? And you you <laughs> kind of got to that. Yeah, that, you know, I, I say that I sourced from a wide range of free range, or, free range organic children. Um, they're from all over the world. And I got about half the questions from tours that I was doing and children that would ask them in person. And that at a certain point when I really decided I wanted to do this, I took to the internet as we are want to do and said, hey, do you have a child who's death interested and death curious? Send me your questions. And that's where the other half came from. Why do you think it's important to talk to kids about death? Is it for them? Is it so that their parents can understand it? Is it so that you can talk about it in terms that um, anyone can understand? What do you think about that? Sure. It's, it's both. It's training for adults and training for children to have better conversations about death. We know this, that, that for many children, the mores, the ideas, the fears of the adult can be pasted onto the child through osmosis, through years of living with their parents. They're going to have a lot of the same prejudices and ideas that the adults have. And if you are an adult that makes it clear to your child that it's unsafe to have a conversation about death, that you're not willing to talk about it, that you're not willing to indulge their curiosity or answer questions in a real and I would say scientific way about death, if you're only willing to say, grandma's with the angels in heaven, we know that the child is going to grow up knowing that it's not safe to have a conversation about death, that there's something wrong about death and that it's bad to die. And that's not what we want them to feel. And it's not like death is going to all of a sudden become totally chill and for the child and the child, will, the child will have no issues with death at all. Nobody's claiming that. But what we want to teach them is that it's okay to have hard conversations. And for many parents, the first hard conversation that they're going to have with their child may be around death. Right. It, it seems like what you were talking about a little bit earlier around uh, death positivity and, and sex positivity and, and other things where we need to ha be having hard conversations with, with kids and other people in a way that's more scientific and realistic rather than euphemistic. Exactly. Yeah. And, and euphemism, we know euphemism is a problem in the funeral industry in general. The slumber room, passed away, sleeping, all of these things are euphemisms, and especially for children whose little brain, little developing brains tend to be very rational and very literal, if you give them all those euphemisms, you're not, you know, there's children who, when you say grandma's sleeping, they think that that embalmed body they briefly saw at the funeral is trapped in a casket underground. And they may be carrying around that fear, that terror of some sort of horrific, you know, buried alive scenario because you as a parent weren't willing to just have a rational, straightforward conversation with them about what was really happening. And I'm not saying that you have to force a conversation on a child, but I think it'll become pretty clear through their questions and through their repeated questions what a child may be sort of afraid of or what they're interested in. Right. Many of the questions I thought were just so charming, like, can we give grandma a Viking funeral? Uh, <laughs> and what would happen to an astronaut body in space? Mm -hmm. Those are things that I, I personally had never considered, but I could see that they would be something someone might want to know about. And I know everyone probably asked you what your favorite question is in the book, and, and you're welcome to answer that if you would like. But I would also like to ask, which question made you do the most research? Mm, that's a good question. Um, 
I, th- I think my favorite is Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs just because it is what started it all and and hearing that child say it and then the crowd just erupted in laughter and they were so supportive and they were so interested in this question that this very young person had brought to the table and brought to the discussion. And I think it I think that's also sort of empowering for children too, right? When you're like, you're a young scientist and you're interesting and your questions are valid and let's explore that in a sincere way. So I think that that was my favorite. But as far as the hardest question, hmm, I really stayed away from questions that had sort of nebulous explanations. And so one of the hardest ones was, you know, am I going to go towards the white light when I'm dying? Can my brain live on? Those sorts of questions because they, they potentially have a somewhat spiritual component to them. Right. And so trying to write about, trying to thread that needle and talk about the scientific properties behind it, like maybe, you know, it's similar to pilots who are at a high G-force and they also experience the, the white around their eyes and feel like they're in a tunnel. And that's because a lack of oxygen, which is also happening when you're dying, you're, you're losing that oxygen. So maybe those things are similar um, or near death experiences or afterlife experiences. Those things are, are harder to thread the needle and talk about than what's more solidly in my wheelhouse, like a decomposing body question, because I can keep that very secular and, and very much, um, in the science-based realm. I think I did pretty well. I haven't had any big complaints about it, but I think those questions where uh, the parent might have a slightly different take on a question, I tried to just say, I don't know. You know, I'm not a spiritual expert. I'm not a science expert, but here are some potential explanations. I thought the comparison to the pilots, as you just described, was a really fascinating comparison that, again, I hadn't considered. So yeah, it was good analog. Sure. When we hear about, you know, walking towards the white light or near-death experiences, you don't often hear the scientific explanation for why that's happening Mm -hmm. or potentially why that's happening. So I thought that was also important to introduce. Your first two books were primarily targeted at adults, I mm-hmm. assume, and and this one is maybe. You mean a five year old is not reading a a memoir about the funeral industry? Right, exactly. <laughs> um, and and this one is obviously inspired by kids, but I, I assume also you know targeted at kids. Writing those two different kinds of books, how did this one differ than your other books? Mm, this one, I would say. It was easier in a sense because it didn't have to be a grand coherent narrative, which I think is one of the hardest things about writing a book is making the whole thing go together. Whereas this one, I I could take it question by question and move forward and get it done in that way and then kind of put it all together in, in the right order so it flowed correctly. Another thing that was tricky was finding the right tone for it. And it helps that my my web series, Ask a Mortician, it's for adults. It has an adult tone, but children watch it all the time. And adults tell me that their children watch it with them. And I don't change anything about how I'm talking in those videos, knowing that kids will also be watching them. Because I think that kids can handle difficult topics. I think they can handle straightforward topics as long as they believe that I am honest and reliable and kind in the reason that I'm doing it. I think that I don't have to dumb anything down. And the way I wrote the book wasn't necessarily for six-year-olds and it wasn't for 30-year-olds. It was for, you know, maybe a a curious, precocious 11 or 12-year-old where kids younger than that could read it and still understand it and enjoy it. And then adults of any age could also read it and enjoy it and maybe go back to, (laughs) this sounds very (laughs) pretentious, but go back to the child inside of them that had this (laughs) curiosity and had this interest and didn't really get to talk about it and go back and be the 11 or 12 year old that they wanted to be (laughs) at that time and, and have that conversation. And I think that if it was for adults, there would have been more pressure to make it edgy or purient in some way. Whereas because it was questions from kids and answers, you know, ostensibly for kids, I think that adults have really enjoyed it. 
Mm -hmm. but there was less pressure to make it adult. The questions that I picked are questions that I think it would be very normal for like a 12-year-old to have. And so many people have the experience of having these real curiosities and questions and they get shut down either by their teachers or by their parents um, and not shut down because, you know, they're bad, but shut down because the adults are uncomfortable talking about it. And so I want to be the adult in everyone's life <laughs> that they can come to. And I'm like, yes, I'm so glad you are here. Come on down. Do I have the answers for you? Or if I don't have the answers, let's see if we can figure it out together. Why do, you know, why do certain bugs eat certain corpses and certain bugs aren't interested and they don't eat the bones? I, that's great. I'm going to interview this entomologist and <laughs> we're just going to have a good old time going on this adventure together. That's great. I'd like to ask you about Halloween because obviously it's coming up soon. And how do you feel about typical Halloween decorations with skeletons and hands reaching out from graves? Are, do you find that disrespectful or is it fun and it helps break down barriers for people to talk about death? What do you think? I, I don't find it disrespectful. That would make me far too much of a curmudgeon to, <laughs> to exist in this world. Fair. But I do think that it is representative of our culture's desire for more and desire for these conversations. And if you go in deep into academic circles about this, there's this big debate over whether the United States is actually a death-denying culture mm. because by technical academic definition, we have so much death that we talk about. I mean, especially right now, you have, you have coronavirus, you have you know police killings, you have all of these things. It, it's just horror. It's a horror show on the nightly news. And my argument is that when I say that we are a death-denying culture, I'm not saying we don't have horror movies. I'm not saying we don't have Halloween. I'm not saying we don't have pandemic death tolls every night on television. What I'm saying is that we don't have the conversations about normal death, typical death, everyday death. We don't have conversations about hospice. We don't have conversations about what's going to happen to mom's body as she declines from pancreatic cancer. We don't talk about, you know, what goes on during a cremation or an embalming or a burial. No idea what happens at a basic funeral home or a basic nursing home, <laughs> you know, these things, which is far more likely to be what actually happens to a person in this culture. And so, taking this back to Halloween, I think that Halloween is an expression further of death that is, that is fetishized and spooky and horrible, but we're excited about that and we're interested in that because something, deaths that are out of the norm and horrific are actually safer for us to engage with than the reality of death and the reality of day-to-day -day death. Think about to the south and Mexico where they have Dia de Muertos, which is very influenced by Western Halloween, but it was actually a reaction to Western Halloween. Mexicans saw that there was too much Western Halloween coming down from the north, and they wanted to return to their much more spiritual, much more death-focused version, which was Dia de Muertos. So they brought this custom back where it had died out mostly to, to indigenous rural areas, but they brought it back to Mexico City and, and to all over Mexico because they didn't necessarily want Halloween to be the main focus. They wanted Dia de Muertos, which is about welcoming the dead back into culture and welcoming direct family members back into culture in this celebration. And so I think just comparing the difference between those two also says a lot about cultural values and what we're focusing on. So do I hate Halloween? Do I not want you to get your candy? No, get your candy. Get all your candy. I loved Halloween growing up, but it's important to note how it fits in to our, our death denial narrative. That's a nice segue because I, I wanted to ask a little bit more about you and your background. And I listened to your TED Talk and I, you said, I think it was in third grade in your diary. Oh, your... yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. Um, today is Halloween. Finally, it's come. Except I spelled finally. I spelled like fin finly, it's come. Yeah, I loved Halloween. Man, I and, and I think that for a lot of morbid children, Halloween is a time to dip your toe into the pageantry of death and to feel closer to death that you're already maybe interested in but don't have another outlet for. Yeah, that's cool too. Halloween's great. 
<laughs> and if some of our listeners haven't heard the the TED Talk, I encourage them to go check this out. But that's a, that's actually the, I think that was in the XOXO conference talk. Oh, was that it? I did. Okay. Yeah. Although I would love to just do a TED Talk where I'm showing my old diaries from 1993. <laughs> <laughs> actually, yeah, the, the XOXO festival, um, that was a really fabulous presentation as well. So um, listeners, you should go check those out. I can put links in the episode notes. Um, in that talk, you kind of describe a couple of ways that your morbid self manifested itself as you were growing up and, and you know, wearing goth stuff with the Aloha shorts and, and whatnot. Um, but how did you decide that you wanted to get a job at a crematory? Because when I was 22, I got like a job at a record store. Yeah, but that why did you get a job at a record store? Um, Because that was the only thing that was available to me, I guess. But like what, a record store, you probably like you probably liked music. True. And yeah. you thought you thought it was cool. And you were like, what if I actually like dive a little more into, you know, how music is sold and, and how we do, I mean, I th and I think my, <laughs> my motivations were the same. I was interested in death. That was my academic interest. Um, I was working in theater in San Francisco, but I didn't have a ton of opportunities and I wasn't super inspired. And I did, I will say that I sort of thought that working at a crematory would be like a cocktail party story in 15 years. You know, that, that I would be like, did you know that Caitlin used to work at a crematory? Isn't that wild? You know, they would say as we clinked our martinis. Right. Um, and I would tell that story <laughs> or that it would kind of lead me to be, you know, to go back into academic work and be inspired in that way. I, wa I wasn't sure. I just knew I was very interested in what happened behind the scenes with, it, with our dead in modern America. And... I didn't know that my life would change and that I would be so wholly inspired by what I saw. And once I started getting into the history of American death culture, I was just hooked. Once I could combine my academic like theory and practice, once I could combine my academic interest and getting more into 20th century American death and how it's developed, and then combine that with the, the physical work that I was doing in the crematory and the things that I was seeing practically day to day, that's when it really came together for me. And it was so interesting to me that my first book, Smoke Gets in Your Eyes, is really about those two things together, the, the history and my day to day life in the crematory. And I realized that what I really wanted to do is get other people excited about this. So from the very beginning, and, and this is hard, it sounds very woo-woo in certain ways, but I think almost immediately I was 22 working in a crematory and I was like, oh, this is what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be talking publicly about the funeral industry for my career. And I can't explain why I immediately knew that was what I was supposed to do and why I'm still doing it to this day, but it just felt like the right fit for me and what I could maintain a passion about for a long period of time. Was there ever a point where you almost noped out like this is too much i can't I can't deal with this? The biggest nopes I've had through my career have just come from being a woman online, so you know the biggest nopes I've had are are nopes that I think are very similar to other advocates you know of my age and and situation. I'm kind of like a friendly white lady, so I don't even have it <laughs> that bad in comparison to what a lot of advocates face being online. But I think I've never wavered in my profound interest in this project and death positivity and all of these things. But I think that when you are being held up to public scrutiny, especially someone like me, who's very much of an introvert, it's not always great for one's mental health and experience in the world. Although taking time away from social media and, and having great therapists and whatnot has been incredibly helpful. I think it's pretty telling that you work with and around dead bodies all the time. And the worst thing about your job is internet trolls. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that any funeral director or, or now in my case, you know, funeral home owner would tell you that it's not the dead bodies, it's the living families and their their grief and their potential anger. And, and I would say, I've never actually made this connection before, but I think that 
something that you have to learn pretty quickly when you work in the funeral industry is that people will get mad at you and they will yell at you and it's not about you. They're grieving. They're in pain. This is the worst day of their lives and something's not going completely right. And as long as you can check in with yourself and say, this isn't my fault, right? This isn't something I could have done better for the family or some mistake I made. As long as you know that you did your job correctly and it's they're screaming at you, but it's not about you, I had to learn that very early. And I think in some ways that can help you on the internet because just as it is in real life, on the internet, it's not about you. If people are angry and people are upset and people are screaming, it is not about you. It is about what you stand for for them in whatever dark place that they're in. That is a very astute observation, I think. And yeah, um, from having gone through my own dealing with relatives who have died, I can see how people yelling at you in person, that must be a really challenging thing for you to deal with as a, as a funeral home director or, or somebody who helps process that sort of thing. And you mentioned you have your own support system there. So I'm, I'm hopeful that you also have that for the internet trolls who are coming at you. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um you know, a lot of it is just, and I, I hate to say this because it sounds so cliche, but a lot of it is just go offline. It's not real. What is happening on Twitter or what's happening on Instagram or Facebook is not your real life. And sometimes shutting those off for a while, you know, there could be a whole hate campaign, a whole white supremacist hate campaign against me right now on Twitter. And I wouldn't know because I'm not checking my Twitter. So how does one become a, a funeral director? I, I think you, I read that you went to mortuary school. What does that mean? Sure. Well, mortuary school is what most people will have to do in the United States to become funeral director or mortician. Those are synonyms, undertaker, funeral director, mortician, basically the same job. And some states have different laws that require you to be both an embalmer and a funeral director and have both licenses. Some you can separate the licenses, which is much better because it's a much lower barrier to entry for people. And as it is, the industry is very protected in that there is a very high barrier to entry if you want to become a funeral director or if you want to open a funeral home. And that's because they're trying, it's economic protectionism. They're trying to protect the old style of funeral homes, the ones that you, you know, buy the embalming and you buy the expensive casket and you buy the burial plot and you buy the headstone and you buy all the flowers and it costs $12,000. That's what they're trying to protect. So it's not an easy industry to enter for that reason. It's definitely, if you think that you're just going to come in and be a fun entrepreneur and, and start your own little funeral home, I am here to tell you that I have a huge audience and it was still very difficult for me to start my own funeral home. So it's not easy, but if you are especially a younger person, a woman, a person of color, and you are willing, you're so passionate about this that you want to go through the hoops to do this, we definitely need you in the industry and to, to continue the industry forward in a different way. I know that you are interested in the idea of green burial and that there are a lot of different techniques that are in the works and, and some are legal now. I think in Washington, you can do the, the composting. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's an exciting time to, to be in death. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, we just legalized in Washington state, actually both at the same time, aquamation, which is a form of water cremation, which uses much less energy than a typical fire cremation to dissolve the body down to bones. So you get, you get basically the same urn full of ashes with an aquamation versus a cremation. It's just a more environmentally sustainable method. And then recomposition, which is the idea of body composting, was legalized at the same time. And at the end of that, you will get soil. And what was always so fascinated to me about that project is that in the wood chips, with the air, with the water, the moisture, whatever happens in those, in those several weeks that you're in this vessel, you literally get recomposed you know it's in the name you get recomposed you you become a different substance you become soil everything in your body including the bones breaks down and becomes nutrient rich soil that you can then have put in a forest or you can take a little bit to have in your garden and mom can grow a tree and 
I just think for people who have that kind of relationship with composting or relationship with nature, that it's a really lovely option. What are the, um, you mentioned something about the the funeral industry wanting to preserve the $12,000 ceremonies and the, the caskets and all that. Is that something that you see as a, a barrier to more green burial practices? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a massive barrier. But the good news is that there are a lot of people who are open to it. There are a lot of of younger funeral directors and more environmentally focused funeral directors who are doing what they can to either open their own funeral homes or to just bring those options to their old funeral homes or the funeral homes they're working for. And sometimes, and I tell young people who ask me about this all the time, I tell them, you know, once you go work for a funeral home, you're probably going to work for an older man, let's be honest here, who has owned this funeral home for so many years, and he's not going to welcome green burial or recomposition with open arms. <laughs> That's not, you know, he's not going to be like, oh, what a genius idea that I never thought of. Let's offer it to all our families instead of this metal casket. But we still need to try. We still need to do everything we can to get the public interested in this because when the public is interested in this and they're asking about it, eventually the funeral homes will have to change with the times. This is my own bias speaking, but I think that there are a lot of ideas that are held by old white men that we should challenge just in general. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's obviously true. And I think that if we could take one slight positive from this this terrible time that we're in right now, it would be that there are many social and cultural and political institutions that people are saying, hey, wait a second this really doesn't work for us. Like we knew that it was a problem that we didn't have Medicare for all. We knew that it was a problem that we didn't have many workers' rights. But this is really a problem now when things start to break down like this. And we need radical change and reconstituting of a lot of these types of social services. And I think funerals absolutely fit in with that. I think it's wild that there's no federal help for funeral costs at all. It's a state-by-state basis, and only a few states will offer you maybe $500 towards a cremation or burial. But the fact that we force people to go to private businesses for funeral costs is not acceptable. And so I think that funerals do fall into this potential sea change that we may see coming if we, if we play our cards right and if we aren't taken down by forces far more sinister than us. What is the environment like with coronavirus in your industry? Yeah, yeah, it's weird. Um, It was for us, my funeral home specializes in hands-on death care. We want the family there. We want the family to be involved as possible. Do you want to help dress mom? You know, do you want to clip a lock of her hair? Do you want to be there and push the button as she as she goes into the cremation machine? We want you to be involved and feel a sense of ritual. And for about two months in in April and May, we had to completely shut that down and have no services whatsoever because so much was happening and so much was changing. And and we didn't, you know, the science wasn't there. We didn't, we didn't, there was whisperings that the Corona body might be dangerous, which we now believe it probably isn't. But it was just a, a, a weird time. And especially for us, it was really, really hard. And for, for my funeral director, especially, because she's the one who now primarily deals with the day-to-day client interactions, I think it was especially hard for her to have to just say no to these families, because that's just the opposite of what we stand for. And now I would say it's better. We have, um, you know, things are different. We have a limited amount of people that can come. Everybody has to be masked. Everybody has to do social distancing. You know, the same as would happen in every, you know, any restaurant or anything that you go and do. Um, But we are able to have viewings and to have the family with the body and to do witness cremations and to come back to those things. So we have not been that profoundly affected, I would say, overall. But the funeral homes that are used to having these more conventional funerals with 200 people and the hearse and the casket and the whole thing, they've they've been very impacted. I can imagine. Yeah. So in addition to reading your books, 
how can people learn more about death? I know you have a YouTube channel. Where else should they be looking? Oh, that's a great question. Um, Order of the Good Death is our uh, nonprofit website. And that's a really great jumping off point for things. We have a really robust resource section that links out to all sorts of different places. So we have a reading list, suggested reading list. We have um, more books for kids in that as well. We have, you know, do you want to be a funeral director? Do you want to learn about green burial? Do you want to learn about home funerals? And those will answer your questions, but they'll also link you out to, to sites that specialize in each area. So um, I think that that's kind of the rabbit hole, where, where you should start on your rabbit hole descent into learning more about death. And that's orderofthegooddeath.com? Orderofthegooddeath.com, Great. yes. What is next for you? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm working on another book. It's going slower than I would like, but, you know, welcome to the pandemic. I think we're all in the same situation. No, I have not learned Portuguese. No, I have not learned how to bake a flambe. I'm just doing the same thing as keeping it going. But I think that I am really interested in my main interest now is every time there's been some sort of mass death event in American history, the funeral industry has really seen changes and shifts after the event. And I do think that in a way, my main place here wasn't so much to be a voice during the pandemic, but moving forward after the pandemic. And how I express what people's options are, how I express the rage of the group about funeral costs, about funeral poverty, about lack of interaction at funerals, how I express that and, and how I am an advocate for that moving forward, I think is going to be important. And so that's kind of what <laughs> keeps me up at night at the moment. With that, I'm going to say thank you to Caitlin Doty for joining us today. This has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you for having me, Amanda. It was nice to meet you. Thanks for listening. If you have questions or feedback about the podcast, or if you have suggestions for people you think we should interview, please send us an email. You can do that at info at sidebarpodcast.org. Also, if you like what you've heard and you want to help us keep producing episodes, we'd be grateful if you'd consider making a donation through our nonprofit partner, Make You Think. I'll put links for how to do that in the episode notes. Finally, I'd like to say thanks to Aaron Lovett at WW Norton for connecting me with Caitlin. Also, thanks to Graham Tully for sound production and pictures of his cats. And thanks to Jonathan Colton for letting us use his song, Mandelbrot Set. Badass fucking fractal, and you're just in time to save the